Welcome and good morning to my Nordic friends and good afternoon to everyone based in Asia. My name is Ida Sjönström and I am from the Swedish Trade and Invest Council in Singapore and I'm your host for today's webinar. We got some truly interesting conversations on the agenda today with an impressive lineup of speakers and panelists that I will introduce to you shortly. By 2030, 65% of the world's middle class population will reside in Asia. Those consumers will demand more from their supply chains as they seek out highly nutritious, fresh and safer produce to be delivered to them conveniently and on demand. So the uh, agriculture and food industry in Asia will have to transform over the next decade in response to this uh, population growth and the changing consumer requirements, as well as the global challenge with climate change. So, uh, I mean, there are significant challenges to Asia's agri-food industry, but those uh, challenges also opens up for great opportunities for innovation. And I think that everyone on this call today agrees with me uh, when I say that we uh, believe in a collection, a collective action and collaboration in order to tap into those opportunities and uh, actually make something out of that. So, I mean, we are here today on this webinar to talk about new methods of food production and uh, how that can boost food security in Asia's cities and also how Singapore has set an ambitious goal to invest in new technologies and to create an agri-food tech innovation hub for the region. So I think this is paving an exciting path for Nordic agri-food tech innovators to break through and scale their solutions in Asia. So in this webinar today uh, that is hosted by Business Sweden, the Swedish Embassy and the uh, Finnish Embassy, as well as EDB and IPI, you will hear from our industry experts on the ground representing the government, investors, as well as the startup scene. So with us today on the speaker side, we have John Eng, who is the Assistant Vice President of the Agri-Food Strategy Team at Singapore Economic Development Board, as well as Adeline Chan, who is the Technology Manager and uh, in IP Intermediary Singapore. Uh, we also have on the panel, John Friedman, who is the Asia Director for Ag Funder and Grow Accelerator as well as Christian Cadeo, the managing partner in Asia for Big Idea Ventures. And finally, we have Eugene Wong, who is the CEO and co-founder of Sophie's BioNutrients. I will give a little bit more in-depth introductions to our speakers later. But first, I would like to introduce His Excellency Niklas Kvarnström, Ambassador of Sweden to Singapore to say a few words about our strong Nordic Singapore relations and our Nordic strengths in the agri food tech space. So, Niklas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ida. First of all, can you hear me? Am I <clears throat> properly online? Yes, we can hear you. And, and you can see me. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm very, very pleased to be uh, on this seminar. I think the embassy is, is proud to be associated with such a fantastic lineup of speakers, and I, I shan't keep everyone from that uh, very exciting discussion for too long. But just to say a few words, first of all, um, about uh, the fact that there are so many Nordic companies that are attending. It's very pleasing to see also, of course, companies from the region and international players, if I have read the list correctly, but it shows really the depth and the breadth of um, companies in our region that are uh, engaged in this super exciting um, future uh, business area. Uh, we are also happy to work with uh, EDB and uh, IPI. I think one of the things that uh, we see so frequently here in Singapore is the, um, the, the role of government in supporting new technologies and new sectors in, in collaboration with companies. 
and also with uh, with research. On the Nordic uh, cooperation here in, <clears throat> in Singapore, first of all, it's very close. We just actually had a, a lunch yesterday with the Nordic ambassadors here, and uh, we work together quite a lot with uh, Finland. Rico, you will hear a bit later on, but uh, with Finland and Norway, not least in uh, the confines of the Nordic Innovation House. And really, if you look at the Nordics in Singapore, it's not a coincidence that we've found a very uh, nice home uh, here in Singapore because there are many things that uh, we share. First of all, uh, innovation, all of our countries, the Nordic countries and Singapore tend to rank at the top of, of the uh, global innovation tables. I think only the other day it uh, came out. And uh, that's the reason that we've chosen to, to focus uh, some of the effort on also on startups and not just our many multinationals that we have here. Another focus that I think we share very much in the Nordics uh, and Singapore is a focus on uh, not just building companies and creating conditions for investment and so on, but also working with research and with the academic sphere. Of course, Singapore has two universities that have in a very, very short time reached um, global top 12, I think it is now, uh, which is very impressive. And of course, in our countries, we have hundreds of years of academic excellence. And actually, we are going into that season where the Nobel Prizes are awarded in, in Stockholm right now, which reminds us of that. And lastly, uh, we pride ourselves on being early adapters of new technology and everything from uh, digital to the future of transport. And so it is, of course, in, in uh, uh, in terms of agri-food tech. Um, and one key reason I think that, that it's such a focus area for the Nordics uh, is that if there's something that really unites the Nordics, it's, it's the focus on sustainability, not just climate change, but environmental um, degradation in general. Um, and that is of course, very, very linked to what we're about to, to talk about today. Uh, for all the Swedish and uh, Finnish and, and uh, international companies in, in listening to this, I want to say just a couple of words about why we find Singapore so exciting. Uh, first of all, what's unique about Singapore, of course, being the only uh, developed uh, country in the region, and even though it's a small island, it serves as a major uh, hub, not just, of course, for transport and having the world's second largest port, but as headquarters for uh, a large chunk of our global uh, corporations as regional uh, headquarters. So it's truly a regional hub and a gateway to Southeast Asia, uh, which of course has a population of 650 million people. And not just in terms of what we're talking about today, but in so many other areas as well, that population um, as we start looking increasingly at a middle class that is up there with, uh, with China and India and so on, this region is very interesting. Secondly, of course, uh, Singapore is a, these days is a world-class, uh, as I say, digital innovation leader. Um, and this is a place where uh, people want to win technological uh, contracts because if you win here, it shows that you know, you're doing, doing the best because Singapore really only is interested in acquiring the best. Uh, it's also, of course, one of the world's financing hubs. And I think uh, as we will hear today from investors and others that that's, of course, key to all new technology. And you can have the best research, you can have government support, but unless you have investors in a financial landscape, you're not going to develop it um, properly. Um, so for all those reasons, we and also interestingly, I think Singapore has come a long way. Um, not probably as early um, as we have been in the Nordics in thinking creatively about climate change and about sustainability, but it's becoming an everyday discussion here, uh, not just in Singapore, but in the region. I think that's very, very promising. So agri-food tech, uh, you know, by the name, you, already there are three words that uh, encompass uh, each of them, uh, a transformation. Um, it stems from the, the very word sustainable. It's of course with the growing population we see it's unsustainable. For example, in Asia with, I think uh, you'll hear the number, numbers I'm sure later on, but more than eventually more than 50% of the world's population, um, but only uh, something like 20% of the 20, 30% 20, of the arable land. That's of course a big discrepancy. Um, and when we talk about these issues, we also come into other issues like water and the scarcity of water and all of these things are drivers for technology, forcing us to make changes. Also, it's of course impossible uh, for meat production to sustain the demand that comes from a growing middle class globally. And that's why we're looking at uh, alternative proteins, uh, new, new ways, ways of eating. So 
there's innovation in food, there's innovation in agriculture, especially the use of land, and of course uh, in technology because so, so much of what we're doing in these areas depends on digitalization, for example. But of course, Singapore is a bit of a microcosm of the challenge because here is a place that really has no physical space and a place that's really trying to break through urban agriculture, breaking through uh, new proteins, and uh, also let's not forget uh, aquaculture uh, because of course that's an important part of protein sources. So uh, with that, uh, really can't wait to hear the presentations and listen to uh, what Singapore uh, is doing and uh, also some of the questions from all of these fantastic participants. So very welcome everyone, the embassy again, pleased to be associated with the event. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, words, Niklas. And uh, I think, as you say, there are some really interesting um, uh, uh, similarities between our Nordic countries and Singapore. And I think there will be some very interesting conversations here today from our keynote speakers and our panelists. So I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker of today. And uh, before I do that, then we jump into it, I would also just like to remind the audience that if you have questions for our speakers, please post them in the chat function or the Q&A. And I will try to cover them in the panel discussions that we will have after our keynote speakers. So our first uh, keynote speaker of the day is John Eng, the Assistant Vice President of the Agri-Food Strategy Team at Singapore Economic Development Board. Uh, in his current role, John engages with companies all over the world to formulate strategies with government agencies to build an enabling ecosystem for the agri-food innovation in Singapore for Asia. John will give us an update on the Singapore Agri-Food Initiatives and what opportunities there are for agri-food tech innovators in Singapore. So please, John, the floor is yours. Let me share my screen for your slides as well. Thank you, Aida. And hey, and hi, uh, greetings uh, wherever you are today. Uh, from the sunny island of uh, Singapore here in uh, Asia. Uh, good afternoon, Your Excellency as well. Thank you so much, uh, Aida and team, for the opportunity to share a bit about uh, Singapore's uh, initiatives in agri-food tech. Um, so very quickly, the next couple of minutes, I'm going to provide a quick sharing on three things. So firstly, why a small island like Singapore is interested in agri-food tech. Uh, secondly, uh, an overview of the sector and our priorities. And uh, thirdly, uh, ways in which uh, you know, we'd love to stay engaged with you, uh, even after this uh, brief session. Yeah, Ida, if you don't mind, the next slide, please. Okay, now I know the sound is working. <laughs> uh, so first off, uh, who is the EDB? So in brief, uh, we are a government agency uh, set up under Singapore's uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry uh, with the primary role of overseeing our industry strategies and partnering with overseas-based companies uh, to use Singapore as a base to expand operations when internationalized uh, in, in other parts of the world, including Asia. Uh, today, uh, we organize ourselves into groups representing then the various industry verticals. Uh, for instance, uh, we produce $80 billion of uh, semiconductor products uh, and $60 billion of uh, specialty chemicals uh, annually, uh, as well as uh, four of the world's uh, top 15 medicines within our healthcare sector. My team was set up uh, two years ago, actually, uh, to leverage these existing uh, capability stacks, if you will, uh, to develop Singapore as an agri-food tech hub. Uh, Aida, next slide, please. So you then ask us, uh, why are we doing this? I won't belabor this point. Uh, all of us know the world is changing really rapidly and the way we feed ourselves has to change. Most of us, uh, with the exception of very visionary people, uh, started off the year without expecting COVID would evolve the way it has become this year. COVID really has reinforced, uh, you know, the, our understanding of the fractures that really have existed in our global food value chain and affirmed the importance of resilience and nutrition uh, to, to, to countries and consumers alike. Next slide, please. 
these problems are especially important to Asia, as His Excellency uh, mentioned. Uh, Asia accounts for really the world's, uh, a majority of the world's uh, population today already. And more importantly, uh, the majority of the world's uh, GDP and the bulk of the world's rapid industrialization and urbanization is ongoing. Uh, for instance, a uh, majority of Asians' diets were plant-based, uh, you know, with plants, uh, especially if you think about rice, at the center of our plate. That's the way most Asians were brought up. With rising affluence, Asia now will account for the majority of meat protein consumption by 2030. And you see there in the slide the different categories, uh, beef, poultry, fish, and etc. In fact, Rubble Bank uh, had estimated last year that Asia is going to need at least $800 billion of investments just to ensure that it's going to be able to feed itself by 2030. So the food challenge is especially important in Asia. And I would argue with COVID, actually the food challenge is now rather than something that we can think about in 2030 or 2050. Next slide, please, Ida. And like many um, other urban cities uh, in Asia and rest of the world, uh, food resilience is an increasingly important agenda. Uh, even for a tiny island like ours of uh, just 710 square uh, kilometers and 5 million people uh, like Singapore. So you see here two charts that were prepared uh, by our Singapore uh, Food Agency very broadly. Uh, Singapore is reliant on 90% of its food uh, via imports. Uh, this used to be our traditional model where, you know, if our population ever grew, we would just simply import more. There isn't much land in Singapore. However, with emerging technologies and global developments, I think we have uh, come to an increasingly clear understanding that we can't keep doing so. And we need to think about alternatives. For example, when we think about vegetables, uh, we produce about, give or take, about 12,000 tons of uh, vegetables a year on roughly about 100 hectares of farmland in Singapore. With the emergence of urban agriculture technologies, some of the players that we are engaging to set up and partner uh, in, in Singapore can actually produce 1,000 tons on just a mere one hectare of space. And furthermore, not just on farmland, but within uh, industrial setting. So if you convert a warehouse, uh, you can actually convert that into uh, arable land, so to speak. With technology like this, we believe that now there is a new way that urban cities can think about feeding themselves for the future. This is part of the strategy that our sister agency, the Singapore Food Agency, is developing this, the plan and strategies under what they call 30 by 30. So Singapore's uh, ambition to be able to provide for 30% of our nutritional, nutritional needs, especially for vegetables and proteins using local production. Next slide, please, Haida. Three of the key technologies which we are most excited about because we think they are firstly the most productive and efficient, but also then sustainable. So we get to feed our, our future uh, families and uh, gen generations as well. The three are urban agriculture, aquaculture and alternative proteins. My team at EDB, uh, the AgriFood team, is responsible for engaging with global players in these three domains. And also to work with the other uh, important stakeholders in Singapore, other government agencies, for example, they are necessary for us to develop the ecosystem here to support at the innovation of agri-food technology. For example, uh, this could mean R&D capacity, this could mean uh, thinking about uh, enabling regulations uh, as well as shared infrastructure so startups don't have to go it alone to invest in infrastructure. Yeah, uh, next slide please, Aida. So everything is a work in progress. We are a very young uh, cluster. Uh, but as mentioned earlier on about leveraging existing capability stacks in Singapore, uh, we are not starting from scratch. So this is a snapshot of how we see uh, the ecosystem of companies here uh, that we've partnered uh, from farm to fork. I don't know if you could click through uh, the various uh, animation. There should be three of them, uh, three or four of them, I think. Uh, for instance, if you think about all the way upstream at the farm, uh, Bayer and Syngenta, we've worked with very closely uh, for, for the last few years 
uh, to set up their R&D centers for plant science. Uh, so then from Singapore, we think about plant science or we think about rice, fruits, vegetables for the region. Uh, and all the way from upstream into downstream uh, to becoming a hub for CPGs, uh, such as your know, Nestle's, Abbott's, Coca-Cola, etc., where they use Singapore as location for them to do R&D production as well as then manage their regional commercial operations and leadership. In between, there is an emerging strong base of F and F ingredient houses in entire ecosystem of suppliers ranging from ADM, Cargill, uh, Christian Hansen, uh, who have various forms of uh, innovation activities here, really using Singapore as their hub then uh, to connect to the rest of Asia's market opportunities. All this. Uh, actually just within this tiny island of Singapore. Besides the corporates, in order for us to position for the future of agri-food tech, you see here then in this slide on the left and right side, uh, partners that we are engaging to think of agri-food tech of the future. On the left-hand side, we are working with our sister agency, uh, Enterprise Singapore, to build up the ecosystem uh, to support startups. One of the key initiatives there is to co-engage partners uh, such as uh, Big Idea Ventures uh, and Act Funder, who have set up their programs here to help us to attract and spark innovation. On the right hand side here, um, I, I trust everyone can see me, uh, Ida. Is everything okay? Yes, uh, we can still hear you and we can see. Your presentation, John. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, <laughs> feedback that the slide is uh, frozen. Yeah. Uh, so on the right-hand side of this slide then, it's about partnering with the public research ecosystem and universities uh, to ensure we energize the best brains in our research institutes, as well as leverage overseas collaborations. For example, we've partnered with universities in Sweden, like Karolinska, uh, to folk, uh, then to think about then, is there things uh, that we can do together when we think about novel foods. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, uh, Aida. Thank you. So where are we today in terms of agri-food tax? So let me just quickly share a snapshot of uh, urban agriculture as well as alternative proteins, as I believe uh, that may be the most of interest to this uh, group that has joined us here today. For urban agriculture, uh, we start off the year uh, with uh, about 20 vertical farms in Singapore. So players on the right-hand side here, such as Susnia and uh, Panasonic, uh, producing vegetables such as kale and lettuce. Since then, uh, we have aggressively planned to ramp up the local production. One of the initiatives that Singapore Food Agency announced is actually a 30 by 30 express scheme. There was really a call for proposals from the best uh, farms in Singapore and rest of the world uh, to actually help to ramp up local production. The uh, results were just announced. So a total of nine farms were awarded just four weeks ago, a total of 40 million uh, Singapore dollars. So there's a growing base of uh, vertical farming uh, in Singapore despite the nascency of the sector. The next slide, please, uh, Ida. Yeah. We will continue to actually need to uh, find options to actually help these farms expand uh, and innovate uh, for the future. To ensure these best-in-class farms have space in Singapore, we also announced the Agri-Food Innovation Park, uh, which is going to be operational uh, in early 2021. Uh, this is envisioned to be a location where the best-in-class uh, farming operations uh, can actually set up and use uh, the location as a reference site and the thinking here is that if we have farming across different modalities, so you think about urban agriculture, you think about insect farming, uh, can we actually bring them all together uh, physically uh, so that uh, we can test out uh, their technologies as well as then explore other collaborations such as circular food concepts. So this is a work in progress and something to look forward to. Next slide. Very quickly, another area of interest is alternative proteins. So many of the companies in this space leading the, the charge are, are actually startups all over the world. So part of our initial effort here uh, was to work with Enterprise Singapore uh, to partner with players such as Big Adventures again, who set up uh, the accelerated programs here 
uh, as part of a dual uh, program with uh, uh, New York City. To support these uh, amazing innovators further, we are partnering with corporates in Singapore to provide collaboration opportunities. For instance, if, you got, if you're going to think about uh, accessing the Asian markets, you need to find the right distribution channels. So there on the left side there, you can see that we partnered with uh, SETS, uh, which is the largest uh, food catering business in Singapore and also the caterer to uh, the aviation business uh, sector here in Singapore uh, to come up with an Asian distribution business targeted at alternative proteins. This was announced uh, sometime late last year. The other aspect is that if, if you want to, as a young innovator, if you need to access infrastructure, rather than investing in it on your own, it'd be nice to actually work with third parties who may have infrastructure and the expertise. So there we partnered with uh, Bueller and uh, Givaudon to set up a first of its kind R&D center that would help uh, startups actually formulate and also think about extrusion of uh, plant-based foods. Thinking of the future, talent is going to be really critical. So we are working with corporates such as Wilma, one of the world's largest agri-commodity players uh, on talent programs to think about then churning out the next generation novel food innovators of the future. Next slide, please. Last but not least, a lot more technology we think needs to be invested in this space all over the world uh, to bend, further bend the cost curve so that we can bring agri-food tech to mass adoption in our food value chain. So there, I think we announced a $144 million program uh, that we will uh, partner with, uh, that we are thinking of actually forging partnerships between our public research institutes and industry. So last slide. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I hope the last couple of slides were useful uh, as an overview of what a small country in Asia like Singapore is doing in agri-food tech. As next steps, two ideas, I think, for us to remain connected. Firstly, connect with an accelerator um, I think the last couple of months, kudos to the good work the Enterprise Singapore is doing. There's, a, there's a, quite a nice ecosystem of accelerators here. Uh, today, we have John from Rec Funder and Christian from Big Idea Ventures as two of our key strategic partners. So yes, do feel free to reach out. The second thing is join events. Uh, COVID is not stopping us from uh, actually having these events. Uh, the Rethink, our flagship event, I know event, the Rethink Every Food Innovation Week is happening this year still in November. It's, it'll be virtual uh, and also catered for uh, global participation. So please join in. The links are there. In fact, there's one full day catered to startups. Last but not least, our contacts are here. So please feel free to contact me or uh, Ming Xuan, our point person on the ground in Stockholm, if you have any further questions. Thanks for your time and look forward to catching up more on our panel later. Thank you very much for that, John. That uh, was a very good overview of Singapore and the development, the developments that are happening here. And uh, to say the least, at least, it's an ambitious goal from the Singapore government in the coming decade. So uh, I will introduce our next keynote speaker for today, which is Miss Adeline Chan, who is the technology manager in the IP intermediary Singapore. Adeline is uh, responsible in supporting the industry with their food and nutrition innovation needs. So some of the technologies and projects she focuses on are alternative proteins, shelf life extension, product reformulations, as well as upcycling food by product, which is basically giving food waste a new life. Adeline has facilitated several technical partnerships between large MNCs and startups in Singapore to innovate new solutions. And prior to joining IPI, she comes from the R&D side in the food and beverage industry. So, so a very interesting background. And Adeline will share more about Singapore's food and agriculture ecosystem and how IPI enables enterprises to grow their businesses through open innovation. So I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to you, Adeline. Sure, thank you, Oida. Let me just um, share my screen and proceed into the slideshow. Um, 
All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can hear you and see your screen. Okay. Thanks, Ida, for the kind introduction and the business student for giving me this opportunity to share with you today about IPI. And thanks, John, as well, for sharing the background of food resilience, um, as well as the Singapore food story. So my name is Adeline, and in the next few minutes, I'll be complimenting a little more on John sharing, touching a bit more on the food ecosystem and how IPI can be your bridge in your next collaboration with a Singapore company. So a little introduction about IPI. We are set up to capitalize and enable enterprises to grow their business through technology and innovation. So as a subsidiary of Enterprise Singapore, we work closely with enterprises to source for solutions, usually technologies, locally and globally. So you can actually see us as the technical arm of Enterprise Singapore. What we really want to do is to accelerate innovation with you, to bridge technical gaps and to connect you to new partnerships opportunities. So within IPI, we are um, organized into six verticals, namely Infocom and Electronics, Personal and Healthcare, Food, Nutrition, and Agriculture, Manufacturing, Waste, and Environment, as well as Materials and Chemicals. So although we've got colleagues looking after each of the sectors, um, more often than not, we very closely collaborate with each other to serve the industry, especially because the, the challenges that the industry face are often multidisciplinary in nature. So in the next two slides, I'll be sharing with you, um, I'll be introducing to you about the Food Innovate Cluster to you, as well as the ecosystem that Singapore has developed to support agri-food activities. The Food Innovate Cluster is actually a multi-agency initiative led by Enterprise Singapore. It is mainly to equip Singapore-based companies with resources to create food for the future, and to position Singapore as a local location for creating food for Asia. So this cluster focuses on helping Singapore companies in four main areas, and IPI plays a part in the second and the third area. So let me just first talk them through before I show you a slide on how and where these hubs are located in Singapore. So on the left side, uh, building knowledge base, we help companies to access markets in Asia and be on top of industry trends. Um, how we do it is through building innovation capabilities, um, such as uh, organizing small scale food innovation product competition. So if you are a technology provider, you can collaborate with our food manufacturers to formulate new novel products to launch into the market. The second one is driving co-innovation. We create opportunities for co-innovation between companies and research institutes by creating platforms. So we invest in pre-competitive uh, new research um, that John has uh, previously mentioned as well. Um, there is CIFB, um, the Singapore Institute of Food and Biotechnology Innovation within ASTAS. Um, we help to connect, um, and IPI, we help to connect you to the right institute as well. On the third, on the third one, to cultivate disruptive tech, we want to grow the, the base of the startups in Singapore and to partner multinational corporates to build new ventures. So what we do is to support the, the um, having accelerator arms in the every food tech companies um, and also to set up corporate venture capital. So some organizations um, supporting these initiatives are the Innovate 360, Grow by Ad Founder, the Big Venture Company, Cocoon Capital, as well as IPI. And the fourth one is to build infrastructure. So we all know that we need to move into pilot, pilot plan before we can scale up. So we have built infrastructures, shared facilities um, for companies to test their products before scaling up. And some of these include um, the high pressure processing facility, the shared facility hub at JTC Sinoco, as well as the collaboration for, between Jobado and Ambula that John has also mentioned. So you can work with our food manufacturers to tap on this infrastructure and the ecosystem to co-innovate. In this slide, I'll be running through virtually with you on our infrastructure in Singapore. So here we have the um, research institutes, the A-star, our polytechnics, our universities, where they do collaborative research together with you. We also have our um, Center of Innovation, our Food Innovation and Resource Center, uh, very much like a one-stop service, one-stop food service center where you can ideate and all the way to prototyping your products. 
there is also the Thomasic Polytechnic, the Glycemic Index Research Unit, where um, they have very good expertise on um, glycemic index uh, um, projects. And of course, we, we will need our incubators, our accelerators, as well as shared facility hubs. So each of them actually have their own strengths. Um, for example, ASTAR is the agency for science and tech research, and there are many different units inside. Um, among it, there is the CFB as well as SimTech. So SimTech is very strong in research capabilities on vertical and indoor greenhouse, while CFB is strong for their food and biotechnologies. So in the near future, food companies will be able to tap on the shared facilities um, that is called the Sinoco Food Hub, and it will be operated by the Singapore Institute of Technology. So if you'd like to hear more about or have a better understanding on their strengths, on their strengths and, and the research and innovation um, in each of these institutes and how you can collaborate with them, just feel free to drop me an email anytime. So moving on to how IPI can help you in the collaboration. So we have a few tools and methods that we use to facilitate partnerships. One of it is through one-to-one -one company engagement. So this is where we offer customized service like scoping up of projects. We conduct landscape studies in white spaces. After we understand your needs, we can then source for companies for you to collaborate with. It can be also as straightforward as a match where we take a technology off our database and we match them to, to the companies. And believe it or not, some of these technologies might even be yours. So vice versa, we get to know your technology offers and we can pair them out to seekers to develop and co-innovate new products for new market. In our second mode of engagement, which is very interesting. Um, we have our virtual marketplace, an online portal where technologies provider can put up tech offers. So tech seekers can then put up a, a request to detail a tech need to seek collaboration with a tech provider. So if you can see on the left side of the slide, our technology, country of origin of our technology offers are actually quite diverse with 45% uh, international partners. Um, so if you have got a technology that you'd like to share or you're seeking for one um, to work with our Singapore companies, we encourage you to come and explore this collaborative route with us. In our third mode of engagement, the technology events, forums and workshops. On the left, we, it, it is showing our annual event, Tech Innovation. This event is for enterprises to exhibit their technologies. In there, we also hold plenary sessions where we can gain insights from the, from the best on innovation practices. We have introduced business matching a few years back. So this is where delegates get to speak to technology providers firsthand to discuss on collaboration and partnerships. From this uh, matching session, we actually have received very positive feedback that is very useful for, for them. So we also organize um, tech commercialization uh, workshops once to twice a year. And uh, due to the current pandemic, we have moved to webinar style. So you're most welcome to participate from wherever you are. On the fourth mode of engagement, this is where um, we have a global network of open innovation partners. So IBR is just in Singapore, but we are widely connected to many innovation nodes across the globe. Um, for example, in food innovation, we have the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, um, the, the CSIRO, um, Thailand RISE, Innovation, innovation Norway, as well, as well as Trendline in Israel. So, sorry. So, just want to share um, some success stories of Singapore um, that have benefited from our facilitation. Um, just want to note that there isn't a one size fit all kind of model when it comes to collaboration. We have many different models and we also encourage you to explore a model that suits you best. So in the first story, it is a licensing technology from the National University of Singapore. It is a purple berry powder that lowers the starch digestibility and slows down sugar release. This company went on to develop many different um, lower and glycemic index bread and buns for different markets. In the second story, um, it's a technical collaboration. It's between a local food tech called Alchemy Food Tech and a food manufacturer um, called Limki. So they have come together to co-develop uh, lower and glycemic index steam buns. 
<clears throat> this success story in the top is where IPI facilitated two matches with this snacking multinational company. It is a technical collaboration. So this Singapore startup has the ability to re-engineer indulgent snack into healthier versions without significant changes to its original taste. So usually when we want to do R&D, most of the time it's either or we don't receive, we don't get a good texture or we don't get a good um, um, taste. But this company, they use a artificial intelligence uh, a model on the platform where they're able to uh, mimic the taste and the, and the texture of your snack such that uh, you can achieve healthier versions without the change in, in your original taste and, and appearance. In the second technology, um, this global metabolic, uh, sorry, the metabolic uh, fingerprinting technology, um, they utilize it to identify the quality or the alteration, geographical region, um, origins, as well as the place profile of any products to ensure consistency within all their products. So these two collaborations have helped our Singapore startups diverse to various markets as this MNC company plans to scale up the technology globally. So we also matched a young startup who wanted to reach out to more distribute, distribution points in Singapore, but they haven't been very successful because their product shelf life was only 10 days. So they needed to ex, extend it um, to at least a month that, so that they can actually reach out to more process, uh, more distribution points. Um, so we, we, we matched them to a high pressure processing unit um, in WRNA in Singapore. And now they're, they're um, juices in their smoothies can have a shelf life of about 30 to 45 days. So um, they have successfully managed to uh, place in more distribution points. This free firm case study um, is a collaboration between Singapore and Sweden by Coincidental. It is to develop a compact water purification system in a, in a suitcase for clean drinking water for the third world uh, um, um, countries. So this is for humanitarian missions. In the last um, success story to share with you, TerraSoil is also a startup. They tap into their client base to test bit and validate. So you can see this is not a um, technical, so much of a technical collaboration, but it's more of a um, test bidding and validation uh, collaboration between two companies um, to test bid their cleaning robot. Hmm. So before signing off, I thought I just um, share some current trending needs from Singapore company. The first trend is that most company that I speak to, they are moving towards using natural ingredients um, with health properties um, and also using non-thermal methods to extend um, shelf life products for food. In the second trend, urban farmers, companies, they are looking for technologies um, for, to, for, for, for it to become a smart a vertical farm. Um, one technology that can save water, utilize less than space and, and produce high yield as well. And the third trend is it's about packaging, um, looking for smart and sustainable packaging um, to ex that can also extend the shelf life of food. So I'll leave you guys with this to take away and thank you so much for your attention. Over to you, Ida. Thank you very much for that presentation, Adeline. Uh, very interesting to see and some really impressive success stories from IPI and your collaboration that you have in the industry. So thank you so much for sharing. And uh, just a, a note to the audience that we will distribute the slides from our keynote speakers to you after the webinar. So it will send, be sent out to you. Um, so I think we have come to the point in the webinar where we will move on to our panel. So let me introduce our panel. And uh, if uh, you in the audience have any questions, as I mentioned before, please post them in the Q&A function or the chat function. And I will try to cover that as well. So let me just share my screen for a moment. All right, so let me introduce uh, our panel today. We have John Eng that needs no further introduction. Uh, thanks to his great keynote speak, 
earlier today. We also have John Friedman, who is the Asia Director for Ag Funder and Grow Accelerator. So uh, John uh, Eng mentioned a little bit before about Ag Funder in his presentation, but let me just give a short introduction. So Ag Funder is an online venture capital platform that invests in the uh, entrepreneurs aiming to build the next generation of great agriculture and food technology companies. So Grow Accelerator is actually Southeast Asia's first dedicated agri-food tech accelerator, which is backed by Ag Funder. And they support both early stage startups, but also later stage scale ups in developing innovative solutions across the entire agri-food uh, value chain. Secondly, we have Christian Cadeo, who is the managing partner in Asia for Big Idea Ventures. So uh, Big Idea Ventures is a capital fund based in New York and Singapore, who themselves say are saying that they are solving the world's greatest challenge by supporting the best entrepreneurs and investing in plant-based foods and cell-based meats. So Big Idea Ventures has some major investors in their funds, such as Temasek Holdings, Tyson Foods, and Bueller Group. Christian also has an uh, extensive experience working for some of the largest technology companies in the world, including Google and, Google and Microsoft, uh, as well as founding several startups, including AdMob, Just, and Domo. So very pleased to have John and Christian on the panel today representing the investor landscape in Singapore, but also in Asia. Finally, we have Eugene Wong on our panel today, who is the co-founder and CEO of Sophie's Bionutrients. Sophie's Bionutrients is creating the next generation of food with single cell proteins, such as microalgae, And uh, they are developing a revolutionizing technology that takes alternative proteins to the uh, microorganism level. Uh, to create a scalable and sustainable source of protein for human consumption. Eugene also won the uh, grand prize of 1 million Singapore dollars in the Livability Challenge last year, 2019, and started his first protein fermentation facility in Singapore. So actually using Singapore as a strategic location in the global expansion strategy. So a very uh, interesting panel uh, we have today and uh, some discussion points that we will go through. But I will also encourage, encourage the audience to take this opportunity today to pick the brains of these uh, uh, guys so we can have some interesting discussions. But let me uh, throw the first question actually back to you, John, in, in EDB, uh, because we uh, heard from you before sharing about Singapore's ambition uh, in the next decade to become uh, an urban agri-food tech hub and uh, reviving its agriculture uh, capability, basically, but still it is a city-state with less than 1% of its land dedicated to agriculture. So uh, please, John, a few thoughts from your side on what you think really needs to happen uh, for Singapore to achieve this ambitious uh, goal and for it to become a reality. Yeah, Aida, let me know if you can't uh, hear me. Yeah. We, we so hear you and see. Sorry, Aida. Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Awesome, great. Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of ambition to become an agri-food tech hub, uh, one way to think about it is maybe Singapore as a uh, crystal ball as to how uh, urban cities might feed itself uh, for the future. However, I think about agri-food technology, it's, uh, not, it's not like a machine, it's, a, it's still a biological system. So it's hard for us to simply turn on a switch and just make it happen. However, we think that uh, with, you know, as I mentioned just now, the existing capability stacks in Singapore, there is a decent foundation for us to build upon. And uh, there are three things uh, that need to happen here. 
so the first really is around talent. Um, I think agri-food technology uh, creates demand for a new breed of innovator of the future. And that's where I think we need to really work closely uh, with uh, companies in the near term, uh, as well as then in the future, maybe even our universities to churn out the necessary uh, pipeline of talent that would uh, help to actually bring this technology to market. Uh, the second piece is uh, innovation. Um, so besides, I think, the uh, IP landscape in Singapore, I think it's important for us to uh, ensure that the uh, local researchers, uh, as well as our networks uh, overseas into the various academic universities, are uh, empowered and energized uh, in agri-food technology. So uh, one starting point there is the $144 million program uh, that we uh, announced uh, last year. Uh, the last thing is uh, networks. Um, so that's where I think uh, it's important for us to make sure that the corporates that are in Singapore uh, and the rest of the world uh, uh, remain engaged on, on this whole need to actually think of agri-food tech solutions. At the center of it all, you know, I mentioned three things, right? So talent, innovation, and networks. At the center of it all, the most important thing is collaboration. The last thing we want here is for, you know, either uh, for, for individual companies or individual countries uh, to think they can go it alone. So for, uh, from our standpoint, all hands on deck, and we hope that even as Singapore, we are able to foster collaborations in this globally. I hope that answered your, your question. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for for that, John. And uh, duly noted on the three different different uh, uh, areas that you mentioned, but highlighting the importance of collaboration to be, of course, one of the key areas for this to be to be successful. Uh, thank you for that, John. So I would like to uh, g uh, give the next question to uh, John in Ag Thunder to uh, share your uh, views and your vision on how you see urban agriculture and food production to look like in the next five years in Asia's mega cities. Uh, and which cities are, do you think will be the leaders in this? Oh, geez, all right. Um, perhaps I should look into John Eng's crystal ball for, for this answer, but... Um, I think the point that John makes and the, you know, the benefit of us um, operating in, in Singapore is that it, it's it kind of the, the city state serves as a, a little Petri dish for experimentation. Um, clearly my answer is slightly biased by the fact that, you know, we've, we've decided to set up a shop here and, and obviously, you know, the whole purpose of this, um, this particular webinar is to explore uh, collaboration opportunities between the Nordics and Singapore. So in terms of, you know, uh, future city and, and what, what it might look like, I think, you know, what is transpiring here in Singapore can potentially sort of set the scene for other cities around the region and around the globe. I think um, what we would need to consider from a sort of policy or a, um, a sort of a civil engineering um, consideration is is that sort of coordination from the top, whether it's the policymakers, the regulators, both on the food side as well as the sort of civil side. Um, I, you know, without sounding um, you know overly patriotic, um, clearly I believe that we have a lot of those ingredients um, at play here in Singapore, so that you know Singapore can serve as a um, as a sort of um, example for other cities to follow um, but you know in terms of you know the need and the response from uh, countries around the region um, you know it's not like we're the only ones trying to solve this problem um, you know the Chinese government has been very vocal uh, especially in recent months around the need uh, their need to solve uh, their own sort of food uh, resilience and sustainability um, for for their ever-growing population and especially, you know, we've focused a lot on, on the sort of alternative protein industry or, or the, the segment of alternative proteins, um, you know, just like Singapore has been very vocal about its uh, agenda to solve for, you know, increased domestic production. China has spoken um, and highlighted the need for, you know, increased uh, R&D investment and, and production in the protein space, specifically, whether that's plant-based or cell agriculture. 
uh, and I'm sure Christian would have more comments to say about that. Um, but you know, closer to home, there are opportunities for you know different um, different countries, different cities to some you know reinvent themselves. I mean, the fact that you know the Indonesian government is looking to rebuild its uh, capital city um, in a new location provides you know opportunity to sort of reconstruct or construct from um, from scratch essentially. Um, you know, part of the whole Asian economic sort of um, opportunity thesis is, you know, we can leapfrog uh, old and dated infrastructure uh, that may exist that may exist in the West and, and take full advantage of, you know, whether it's 5G type technologies or in the case of food and ag novel production methods. Um, so the, the, there's, there's a real need, obviously, in Southeast Asia with rising population and climate change, and there's a massive opportunity for players and for technologies to get involved. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that uh, that answer. And as you say, it is a, a, a crystal ball would be interesting to have at this point. And of course, it's uh, hard to predict exactly what will happen, but uh, for sure there will be some uh, improvements in this industry in Asia with the investments that is going on. So wh why don't we follow up on that uh, track of alternative proteins? And I will uh, throw the question to you Christian, uh, because you are running a 50 million US dollar fund specifically looking at companies in alternative proteins. So uh, what are the key trends in Asia on alternative proteins uh, that you have seen in the last two to three years? And how uh, are you expecting this to change in the, let's say, coming five years? Christian, can you hear us? We cannot hear you. I've unmuted. I, can you hear me now, Ida? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, great, great. Um, I did want to make one clarification. I unfortunately did not find, uh, I was not a founder of AdMob or Domo. I wish I did. I'd be on a big yacht by now, but I did work for the company. So just one point of clarification. Um, as it pertains to your question, I think probably along a couple of different vector points, right? Probably the first one is the breadth of all protein that we're seeing. So when you look at all protein, specifically in the US, it's all about beef burger patties, right? And it's really focused on one specific space of the all protein space. That's not happening in Asia. You know, when we look at our portfolio, we've been invested in about 26 companies. We've seen companies who are tackling everything from you know, beef, eggs, uh, fish, right, dairy, uh, yogurt, ice cream, you name it, right? So every kind of product you can possibly think of that has an animal protein component in it, we've probably seen some amazing entrepreneur who have, are trying to focus on creating a plant-based equivalent of it, right? So that's number one is the breadth is quite wide and, and far. I think the second thing is really what we're seeing also is on the cell-based side, right? We're seeing a lot of innovation, a lot of smart people who are coming into the space and I think this is where Singapore comes into play, which is really, especially on the cell-based side, you know, in the US, it's never gonna go anywhere because the incumbents, politically, they have too much capital and the cell-based companies will never be able to compete. Uh, Europe is a little bit challenging just because you know, of the GMO aspect, right? But I think I'm, I'm, we're still quite bullish on uh, Europe for cell-based. But I think where we think it's gonna be the fastest growing aspect is definitely in Asia, and if not specifically Singapore, because you don't have that nascent kind of incumbency who are fighting against innovation, right? So we're seeing a lot of smart entrepreneurs. You know, John, I mentioned before, you know, we invested in, um, in Shockmeat as well as John, you know, my friend John Friedman has invested as well. We both invested in Shockmeat. Uh, we've seen some other amazing companies here in the region. So I think the cell based side is going to grow leaps and bounds. And in fact, I think that one is going to overtake a lot of other markets. So those are kind of the two trends that we're seeing is uh, the breath of all protein is more than pat patties and it's basically growing in all different segments. And the cell-based side, specifically the technology side, is innovating quite rapidly, specifically in Singapore. Thank you so much, uh, Christian, for, for that. And uh, let, let's stay on this topic uh, some, some more because we also have um, 
someone from within the industry. So I think uh, following up with you, Eugene, on this, you are in the business of single cell protein. So how do you predict that the adoption of alternative proteins will develop in Asia in the coming five years? And what do you see as the, the key barriers for that adoption to really take off? I'm not sure about five year time frame. You know, uh, five year, in my opinion, personal opinion, is possibly a little bit too short, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I can guarantee you, alternative protein will take off here in Asia, no doubt. It's just that when will this happen? I could be wrong, you know, because if the next uh, swine flu pandemic hit the the hawk in China, and all of a sudden the poor Chinese don't have their pork to eat then they may jump on the plant-based wagon or alternative protein wagon uh, pretty soon. But in my personal uh, observation, I would say that, that give it about 10, 20 years, alternative protein would definitely take off right here in Asia. But then again, compared to Europe and the States, it will take up in a very different uh, shape and form. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't foresee that it will come in like a plant-based burger. I would foresee that, you know, when the price drop, the first ones uh, who is going to eat the alternative protein will be the animals that the Asians are eating. So meaning the animal feed industry will take on the alternative protein first. And then when the price drop even further or drop uh, low enough, then they will incorporate the alternative protein into the already being seen of the a lot of the mock meat here in Asia. Say for example, seitan, tempeh, uh, tofu, you know, nowadays it's made with wheat and soy. Going forward, you're going to see that coming from the insect protein. You're going to see that coming from our microalgae protein. You're going to see that coming from all sorts of crazy protein because why? Soy and wheat and pea will be too expensive for the Asians to consume. So say, for example, I saw a question from the audience. The hydroponic uh, vegetable today is not taking over the, the, the farm industry by storm, yes, that's for now. You, if you're not looking long enough, then you say hydroponic is not gonna take off. You know, I think you gotta be a little bit cautious on that. You know, people will keep growing, especially here in Asia, they kind of grow like crazy. However, farmland and space is just that limited. You know, you can't grow more for more people. What are you gonna do? You have to look at Singapore. This is something a lot of Singaporeans then themselves don't understand is that Singapore is going to be the leader, the pioneer, the role model for the future of farming. Because quite frankly, no matter animal farming or agriculture or any, uh, uh, the agriculture that we're doing today, it's just so messy. They will keep on doing it, fine. But in the, in the, at the end of the day, they will look at it you know, and say, wow, we have too many people. We got to look at Singapore and see what they're doing and copy that throughout the world. That's just my two cents. Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, a lot for that uh, uh, for that answer, Eugene, and very interesting to hear. So uh, I was actually going to raise that question that you just mentioned that you saw from the audience. So we had a question from the audience saying that why hasn't uh, hydroponics taken the vegetable growing industry by storm in a big way. Uh, it's been around for a long time and how does um, hydroponics compare against urban farming technologies? Uh, I would like actually to open up to our other panelists to answer that as well. Maybe I can throw it to you, uh, John, in, in Ag Funder, if you have any thoughts on this question as well. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to sort of unit cost economics and just cost of production when you're up against a, an established um, you know, industry of traditional ag and supply chain that's providing your markets and your cities with you know, low cost of production vegetables. Um, but you know, the future is clearly gonna look very different. I mean, we need only, here in Singapore, we only have to think back to, um, what was it, mid-March when uh, Malaysia implemented its movement control order and for about 24 hours um, everyone in Singapore thought that you know essentially the borders were shut and for 24 hours until the trade ministries um, I guess clarified that there would still be uh, movement of goods between the two nations um, 
you know, the 75%, oh no, sorry, more than that, close to you know, eight, um, 80 odd percent of, of vegetables, which we rely on primarily from Malaysia, there was, there was massive concern that we wouldn't get that anymore. Um, and, you know, we've seen a number of, um, of companies uh, start up operations here in Singapore. John Eng had a number of, of um, examples in his slide deck, whether it's Verdi Veggies or Panasonic, et cetera. Um, a lot of guys looking to build indoor uh, controlled environments, um, uh, veggie farms. Um, there needs to be a, there, there needs to be more education done for the consumers to persuade them to choose local. And we're starting to see that now. You know, Singapore Food Agency has come out with a number of uh, sort of campaigns to you know persuade consumers to buy local, to educate them around you know potentially um the benefits not just from a sort of carbon footprint but, but perhaps uh from a sort of food safety or cleanliness factor uh, i'm not pointing fingers or making accusations here but you know clearly there there's there's a fair amount of i guess consumer confusion when it comes to certification right organic versus non-organic right if it's if it's grown hydroponically you cannot qualify for organic status because it's not grown in the soil some people don't quite realize that difference um i, I digress and kind of go off topic but there, there's a lot more i guess education required um and obviously hoping to achieve a certain level of scale until the economics makes sense i'll open it up i'm sure everyone else has comments to add <laughs> Yeah, anyone else comments on, on that question before we move on to the next question? I guess I, I would just add, Christian, I agree with John on a lot of points. I'm actually surprised why it hasn't taken off so much, right? And I think my, just what I think my thesis is probably just a cost basis, right? And obviously you need a little bit more supervision of using hydroponics. But outside of that, I am, frankly, I'm pretty miffed why it hasn't taken off so much outside of the cost structure. So. Didn't really answer that question, but I agree with the person who asked it. Yes, all right. Thank you for that. Um, so we, we have actually a lot of questions coming in from the audience. We will probably not have time to go through all of them. So what we will try to do is uh, to, to get answers to all of the questions uh, afterwards, and then we can also share this with all the participants. Um, so uh, we will do our best to try to answer uh, all of them. I would go, like to go back to AgFunder again and just uh, ask you the question, you are evaluating a lot of uh, startups in your role in, in AgFunder and in, in Grow. So just some um, uh, would be great to hear some sharings from you on what are the most common problems that you see companies innovators innovators are trying to solve and what are some of the most interesting solutions uh, in the context of, of the agri um, food tech industry here in Asia um, clearly there's some um, what's the word I'm looking for connection between so big problems, big ideas. Um, <laughs> no, uh, it's 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 uh, no coincidence that obviously Christian is at Big Idea Ventures and they're focused on alternative proteins. Um, there is, uh, you know, there's we see a lot of interest in this space, both from the market side. Clearly, the market opportunity is huge, um, but I think Christian would agree it's become a bit noisy in terms of you know the number of startups that have. Um, come to you know come to market or, or trying to come to market you know they've, they've got a another idea for plant-based or cell-based uh, i think it's fair to say the the bar has been raised in terms of the types of companies or the the, the entrepreneurs and the founders that we've seen um uh, approaching the market over the past sort of 12 to 18 months um outside of the alternative protein space i think you know adeline made mention of um uh, the sort of demand around or, or the, the opportunity around sort of personalized nutrition. I think that's going to be a massive space. Um, and it kind of ties into sort of proteins. It ties into um, sort of just more uh, greater, again, consumer insight and appreciation around just how, you know, gut health works. Um, it's no longer simply, you know, um, quantity of food production. It's quality. It's 
its nutritional benefit. You know, hence the 30 by 30 mission has been articulated specifically to use sort of nutritional needs as opposed to simply like food. Um, but yeah, when you consider that, you know, hundreds of millions of people around broader Asia are still malnourished. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be, or, or, you know, whether it's personalized nutrition or simply underfed, you know, we had during the COVID um, situation on, you know, one day it's fearing that we're not going to get enough vegetables. The next day we've, um, you know, we've over purchased too many eggs uh, because we thought that, you know, um, supply, supply chains would be disrupted. And unfortunately, you know, there was the case where we had to um, discard a large quantity of eggs, which just couldn't be, I guess, sold quickly enough. And that's just sort of scratching the surface. I mean, some of the, the stories that you heard taking place in, in the Western markets during COVID when it came to just supply chain disruption and the impact that it had on, on production systems was just appalling. So greater innovation, um, efficiencies um, around just supply chain and transportation and distribution of, of produce, I think is, is a critical area for us to address if, we're, if we want to if we want to transform the food system into a more sort of sustainable vision. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, actually, I will, I will keep you for some more time here, John, because we have an interesting question that I think uh, both for you, but also for Christian to comment on, which is um, uh, a question that says one of the problems with agri-tech is the larger capital costs to get started uh, and then to scale, especially when you look at the farming and production section. So when you have an end product that has relatively low margin, margin from the start, this might not be something that in, interests investors compared with other IT and software companies. So how can we get investors more interested in agri-tech industry and also make those investments? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just going to give a quick answer and then I'm going to hand the mic over. So, um, it's, it's a really valid comment and you know, potentially, you know, almost a, a concern. I mean, I, I'd like to hear the other panelists' views, especially John Eng, perhaps, you know, when it comes to more of a policy approach to solving this. And obviously the Singapore government is, is doing a lot to support this nascent industry and to provide capital sort of uh, funding into this space, recognizing, I believe, um, that, you know, you know, from an investment perspective, obviously, agri food tech still receives uh, uh, not enough money, basically, in, in, in a short answer. Um, it's, it's an ongoing process for us and Big Idea Ventures and many other players in this space to make more investors aware of, I guess, the need for, and the commercial opportunity that's available in, in agri-food. It just might take slightly longer um, because as John Eng uh, mentioned, you know, it's not just like software and you can just sort of deploy straight away. This is a sort of biological system that we're talking about. Um, but yeah, I invite the other panelists to. Yeah. So, so John, let's, let's, let's throw, throw the ball over to, to your report and, and hear your thoughts on this. I'm assuming you're referring to me, uh, Aida. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Uh, and thanks, uh, John, for the, uh, the, the ping. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, because this is a new space, uh, ultimately more begets more. Um, so it's all about confidence building and ha having everyone better understand this space a lot more. It's hard to find experts in agri-food tech, uh, to be honest, at this point, it's such a new category. However, I think the way Singapore thinks about it is then we want to be able to uh, work with players who are able to dem who have demonstrated their technology to demonstrate themselves in Asia. So I, I think that what that means, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, his uh, excellency also mentioned uh, start at the start early on as well, because we are a small island, we'll have to pick and choose. Uh, we'll probably try and work with uh, what we might assess then with partners as best in class players. Uh, to further demonstrate their technologies, because then uh, the results from that demonstration would then help to actually build knowledge and also then build confidence uh, as the investors start to understand this space a lot more. 
and we'll look at players in this in, uh, in this category uh, across the various domains, whether it's urban agriculture, aquaculture, in fact, uh, as well as uh, alternative proteins. The next piece is that uh, once we have then that uh, base of uh, players in Singapore, uh, we've already started those efforts in terms of bringing technology to bear. Uh, so R&D resources and infrastructure with the goal of then uh, improving the unit economics that John Friedman uh, mentioned just now. Uh, we believe technology has a major role there to play and we, we like to think that our researchers in Singapore and our networks overseas can help us to solve this issue. Yeah, but more, more importantly at this point, this is a new space. We need to get everyone um, aware of the opportunity and the challenges uh, and more hands on deck, as I mentioned just now. Hmm. Thank you so much, John. So I would like to, to spend the last uh, 10 minutes or so that we have of this webinar to focus in a little bit more into Singapore specifically and, uh, and uh, why Singapore makes sense for agri-food tech companies to, to look towards and the opportunities here. So let me stay with you for some, some longer time, uh, John, from, uh, John Eng from ADB. We have one question that uh, is asking, because of Singapore is so ambitious in these fields, what are their, uh, what, what grants or benefits will be available for agri-food uh, tech projects in, in Singapore? So any, any last comments from your side on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, grants is the last thing that, that uh, we, we will uh, work on. I think we are investing a lot more into uh, infrastructure and uh, programs. Uh, so yes, uh, we have grants, uh, but uh, very targeted. Uh, some of it is structured as uh, grant calls. Uh, so for example, to excite the researchers, the uh, $144 million uh, that we put forth uh, through Singapore Food Agency and uh, Agency for Science, Technology and Research. It's called the Singapore Food Story R&D Program. Uh, the other kind of a ground call that uh, the Singapore Food Agency did as well recently is actually the $40 million grant uh, targeted at, uh, as a call for proposal from uh, farms to actually expand local food production. As we build up this sector, uh, this is a new sector, uh, there may be additional grants we'll think of uh, in the future, right? Um, you know, some, for example, targeted at... Uh, uh, building a pipeline of future food innovators. Um, yeah, so we'll have grant programs targeted at uh, solving for the ingredients to actually build up the ecosystem. Uh, the various economic agencies, whether Economic Development uh, Board for overseas companies or Enterprise Singapore for local enterprises uh, should have uh, and, and, and do have uh, individual programs to support companies on a, a more bilateral basis. So come speak to us to discuss further. Thank you for that, uh, John. So stay, staying uh, on the topic of, of, uh, of Singapore still, I would like to go back to you, uh, Christian, and have your views on how, um, how in, in, in your perspective, Singapore lines up as an agri-food tech hotspot regionally and, and share why you think it makes sense for agri-food tech companies to uh, establish presence in Singapore. Yeah, I would distill it down to a couple points. The first one, and I'm not saying this because John Ng is on the, uh, from EDB is on the phone call, on the conference call, but number one is from every le level of government, I've not seen so much support for not only funds like us and the ag funder, but also entrepreneurs, whether, you know, it's Eugene at, at you know, at his startup or any other startups, whether you are locally here or from basically in Finland, every arm of the government is willing to help. You know, from the research arm, which is ASTAR, from economic development, from EDB, from basically incentive, which is uh, ESG to, to massive, to Southern Wealth Fund. I have never seen any government put all of their muscle behind in making sure that agri-tech as a whole is successful, right? So if you ever need any resources, no matter if you're a local entrepreneur or a foreign entrepreneur, there's someone there that's going to help you and go out of their way to help you. And I can point to so many, so many scenarios on that one, right? So that's number one. Number two is uh, if you look at Singapore, it's clearly becoming a nexus of capital as it turns our agri-tech, right? You do have us, we got the adventures here, you know, we obviously want to meet amazing entrepreneurs from Finland, we have the ag funder, we have a whole bunch of other VC funds. 
that are keen to basically make an investment because there's an influx of capital focus on the sector. So that's number two, which by the way, was infused by the Singapore government, right, which kind of kickstarted this. So that goes back to my point number one. Uh, the third one is talent, really amazing talent. And I think a lot of people are somewhat surprised, maybe perplexed that, hey, there's only 6 million people in Singapore. How can you say that talent is uh, widely available? And I'd argue wholeheartedly, I would be the first one to raise my hand and say, I've, we've been able to find amazing talent, not only from our fund, you know, we were able to hire two PhD food scientists on staff, but the people we've invested in as well, right? So whether you need basically a bio, biologist, biologist, food scientist, whoever it is, you know, I think it's been quite encouraging to find great talent that wants to go in this, in this industry. So I think those are really kind of the three things. And, I think the fourth one, and this is important for a lot of startups coming from Finland, is it's a small enough community where I think there's this American term called playing it forward. Like you could reach out to myself, I bet you can reach out to either the Johns or Eugene uh, or His Excellency and his staff and stuff like that. And people want to help you out, right? So it's not like, you know, when you use US as a market, it's such a big market, it's really hard to really get a grasp and build a network. You reach out to one person here. And it's like three degrees of connection. So I think those are really kind of the points where, frankly, you know, if there's an amazing agri-tech company in Finland, they could parachute here. And I would imagine within weeks, no, months, if not weeks, you know, they could get the ground going in terms of building a network, getting the right resources from the government, reaching out to the right people who have the capital and building a team. Thank you very much, Christian. So uh, I think we are coming to almost an end of this uh, very interesting discussions. So I will actually take one last question that I will uh, um, go back to you, Eugene, to uh, end this panel discussion. And as I said, there are questions we haven't answered yet. So we will try to get those answers after and, and share that as when we share the presentations from the keynote speakers. Uh, so the last question that I have for you, Eugene, following up on the point that John, Eng, and Christian just mentioned, um, uh, I know that you actually started your business idea uh, when you were living in the United States uh, and you moved to Singapore and have now set up your business here. So please uh, share us a little bit more about uh, how Singapore plays a part in your global expansion. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, Solvice Bionutrients, uh, we're the product of uh, EDB, IPI, and Enterprise Singapore, so to speak. I was, uh, I was first approached uh, by a guy from EDB uh, when, I was, uh, when I was pitching in New York, Brooklyn, New York. He said to me that you want to come to Singapore to pitch? I said, why not? You know, so first I came here uh, back then was 2017, I remember. And immediately I won my first grant out of the blue. I don't know why I won, you know, because I mean, uh, there's uh, so many wonderful startups uh, pitching at the same event. But I, I guess, you know, number one is that I, we're very different because we're back then, there's not a lot of food and agriculture technology startup, you know, so we're different. And number two is that uh, the panels uh, back then uh, saw the future that Singapore needs, you know. So I, I, I think Singapore is a wonderful uh, launching place uh, for food and ag uh, tech uh, startup because why? The future of the food and ag tech is a resource crunch innovation, meaning that you got to think of a way to produce your nutrients, your products, your foods out of very, very little resources. Singapore, number one, first and foremost, understand the crisis. Where there is the crisis, there is the opportunity. Singapore does not have fresh water. Singapore is less than half the size of London. And yet they're asked to produce 30% of the foods by the year 2030. That's a huge opportunity for all the entrepreneurs. If you have a wonderful idea. Number three, Singapore is the crossroad of all kinds of talents from all over the world, not just from Asia, but from Europe, from US, from down under. So it is a perfect place to mingle, to exchange and to have more idea, to brainstorm and to really build up a trusted and tested global business in the future. And last but not least is the love and support by the Singapore people and governments. 
And quite frankly, you know, I feel very fortunate to come to Singapore. Why? Because uh, a lot of time in the States, I felt American is just so self-centered. They see the world within the 50, uh, 51 state. Well, actually, should I say the 49 states? They don't even extend their, their territory to Alaska or Hawaii, you know? And so they're so self-centered. They don't see the world outside of the states. Their world, you know, the, the baseball, for example, they call it world champion. Well, all the teams are, are domestic, you know? While here, or even in Europe, you guys should understand better. We really have the global view. And that global view, in my personal opinion, is very, very important, especially going forward. You can't just concern about Trump anymore. You have to concern everybody in the world. That's what I think. Thank you very much for that answer, Eugene. So uh, time is running up. We have a, a few, few minutes before we will end this webinar today. So I would like to uh, uh, say a big thank you to everyone that has been part of this panel today and our keynote speakers, as well as our organizers for this webinar today. And of course, our uh, participants that listened in today. I hope that we can take these discussions further and actually develop some concrete collaborations between Singapore and our Nordic countries. So on a final note, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Rico Mekele, who is the Councillor for Trade and Innovation Affairs at the Embassy of Finland to say some closing remarks for today's webinar. So over to you, Rico. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Ida. Okay, now everyone noticed we are in the same big room here. Okay, so uh, in addition to my role at Embassy of Finland, I'm part of a team of Nordic Innovation House Singapore that connects Nordic promising startup and growth stage companies to Southeast Asia through Singapore and to Singapore market. And together we have an offer for all the Nordic companies interested in Singapore. In December, we will organize a Nordic showcase of food and agri-tech companies at Tech Innovation event that will be part of Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology. That will be second week in December, fully virtual event. So we will send you all more information about that. Also, we plan to organize a market entry program, fully virtual next spring towards Singapore for those companies who are interested in meeting the best potential customers or prospects and partners in Singapore. So we will send you more information about all of that. Then I would like to close by thanking a couple of people. So Ida, our MC and main producer for this event. And then also Ming uh, Zhuan Li, who, who in the background helped to organize this from EDP side. And now let's all focus on making the world a better place with our food and agri-tech solutions. There's huge demand for better solutions there. Thank you, everyone.